So today we have uh, Xavier, Xavier Giro y Nieto. He's, he's a, a, a professor at the, at the UPC, Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya. Uh, he's, be, he's been very active uh, for the last years here in Barcelona, and he's, be, he's been very active e either in research or the, also in, in, in consulting with companies. He has, uh, he has been, been doing lots of... Uh, um, He has been doing lots of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, he's been very active in the research and, and he's been doing lots of things in, in Barcelona besides uh, uh, research and, and uh, no, that's not my day. Uh, uh, he, in, the, been, in academic and business space. And yes, uh, yes, and he's been organizing uh, congresses, many congresses, as he will speak at the end. Uh, and you can see he's also very active on Twitter. And, and he has a very nice group here in Barcelona that, that it's not only him, but it's, it's his group that they are doing lots of things. The worst presentation ever. Sorry, Xavier. Uh, so just keep in mind to do the, the questions. And at the end, after these two questions, we will post a, a link to, to Hangouts. And you can ask him personally more, more questions. So the, the, the presentation doesn't stop here. And you can, if you have more questions, that, that's a very nice opportunity to talk to Xavier and from, from, from face to face. And, and that would be also nice. So Xavier, the, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alex, for the invitation. And thank you, the whole community, the whole communities. Uh, for the invitation for this talk. I'm very excited. I guess it's a, quite a milestone of giving a talk to so many people from different places in the world that otherwise it, that's really hard to, to achieve. So I'm very happy to see people from around the world who have shown your interest in, in a talk, on this talk. Okay, so I'll um, start with the talk as, as <clears throat> As um, it has already been uh, shared on on the chat, the slides are um, already online. So if you go to my Twitter handle, you have it here on the top right, Doc Chabi. You can get the slides on on PDF format, and this might be useful because there there are many uh, resources that I put a lot of effort in in linking. Okay, so if you want to learn more, uh, that uh, I think that's a good place uh, to to start from. So this talk is called Deep Self-Supervised Learning for All, and it will uh, explain why this, so what this concept of self-supervised learning is and why it's very relevant in the field of deep learning and, I, and why I think that this year especially it has, it's been like the, the central uh, concept on, on research in artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. So, Well, knowledge like uh, several uh, students who have helped me in, in this specific topic. Later at the end, you have the, the whole picture of the students who are working with us, of our team. But uh, I have been working on this topic of self-supervised self learning for quite a lot now, a few years. So I think I should acknowledge uh, all these people who have actually taught me uh, what I would try to share now with you in the best way possible. Okay, so let's start motivating. Um, so you see this is a tweet from a sir professor called Jan LeCun. He's one of the fathers of deep learning, like this uh, field in machine learning that has revolutionized um, many uh, applications, going from computer vision, natural language processing, and audio. Maybe these are the most, the ones that we already have in our um, devices or we already have apps that work relatively well on computer vision and, and, and language. Um, processes, but also it's 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 start it's also uh, being deployed for uh, robotics applications or other tasks in which there's a lot of potential to grow. So that's it's a, a field that has grown a lot. It's still growing a lot. It will probably grow a lot more, uh, especially because as you said, as you have seen, like babies are already learning from it. So we should all you should all be uh, aware of that and learn as much as possible because the the next generations are already having like babies for them. Uh, so books for babies for that. So uh, focusing on that tweet, like this father of, of deep learning, Yael Kuhn, now he's the, the research, main research scientist in, in Facebook. Uh, he kind of answered like in March 2020 to this tweet saying like, uh, supervised machine learning doesn't live up to the hype. Yael Kuhn, where do we go from here? So, okay, so what's after the supervised machine learning, which will be like the, 
the most classic way of solving machine learning problems. And he mentioned like this concept of self-supervised learning, obviously. And uh, today, my goal for today's talk is that you understand what this concept means, self-supervised learning, and you can put it in, into context with the uh, supervised uh, classic concept of deep learning. Um, so let's start. I will be using this slide quite a lot. It's a slide chicken from Open MMM Lab. That's um, lab uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, China, China um, and where they have a nice uh, open source uh, repository with many different techniques uh, that are related to self-supervised learning. And I think that this diagram that kind of puts some keywords that I will explain now uh, is going to help in understanding. So first you see here on top, you have unsupervised learning, then you have another concept called representation learning, and then inside unsupervised learning, there's like this concept of self-supervised learning. And I will, I will try to uh, explain what are, how these three concepts relate. And here below, you, you find like names of, of techniques that you might have heard about uh, that, they, that they relate to different types of learning strategies that we can uh, apply on, on machine learning. So let's start with the most basic one, the, what does representation learning refer to? So here on top, you have the concept of representation learning, and you see like some part of representation learning falls within self-supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So, and also here you see that in representation learning, you have this arrow that goes to ImageNet, ImageNet pre-train that hopefully many of you already have know what I'm talking about. If not, I will explain now what does this ImageNet pre-train mean. Okay, so in, let's say in classic machine learning before the deep learning revolution, let's say, uh, most of the machine learning uh, problems were treated in two stages. First, we had data, let's say, for example, uh, images, and somehow we were extracting features, which were like basic data that you could uh, get from the extract from more complex uh, data. So let's, let's assume that we had somehow magically some feature extraction that given one image of an animal, uh, it could give you the weight and the age, okay? I know that that's very complicated to build, but let's assume by now that, that we have it. So we'll have like, we could, instead of having a bunch of pixels, in the end we'd have like only two values, weight and age. And based on these two data, on knowing, knowing the weight and the age of an animal, we could try to build a classifier that would in the end uh, predict whether the animal in the image is a cat or a dog, okay? So maybe this classifier, in a hypothetical case, it would say that, oh, so I think that this image is looking only at the weight at the age. Uh, it's a cat with a 0 0.7 probability and 0 0.3, 30% of probability of being a dog. And then at the end, you may take a decision. Normally, you, you would take the highest probability and say, okay, so this image belongs to a cat. So notice that there's this bottleneck, this feature extraction, that in classical machine learning, this is um, handcrafted, like somebody used to, to define some way to, let's say, to estimate the weight or the age given a, an image of, of an animal. So what happens when the classifier that we are using is actually uh, implemented as a neural network? So I, I guess many of you know how neural network works. Some of, some of you, I'm assuming that you don't. Okay, but basically, uh, these near, deep neural networks, it's, it's, a, it's a, a machine learning tool that it's built on layers, okay, in which, like, let's say, data is processed. Uh, first, you process a bunch of, of, of data, then there are, like, new data, so there's a, a transformation of the data, which is later processed again, and there's, like, transforming layer after layer after layer. And in neural networks, let's say, the, the last layer, if, if you want to solve uh, cat and dog classification will give you like the probabilities of being a cat on a dog. Then what is interesting of neural networks is that if you add many layers, you will, when you run your training on machine learning, you would uh, learn the parameters for all the layers. So the basic idea of, of one of the um, big um, opportunities that we have with deep learning is that we don't need now to split anymore into, into stages, the feature extraction stage and the classification stage. We can have neural networks that by adding many, many layers, we can directly inject in our neural network the raw data. We don't need to think and design like if the weight or the age or the color of the fur or whatever uh, attribute you think a human might think that it's important to decide if the animal is a cat or a dog. We totally forget about that. We let the network 
to learn which features, which representation, actually we'll be using the word representation, uh, are important. So we are kind of uh, learning a representation for the image, which will be useful for whatever task we want to solve. If it's a classification task between cats and dogs, we're going to, if we do it well, we're going to uh, build, extract the features, the presentations, which are optimal uh, after an optimization process to solve that task. And this is the end-to-end -end basic concept of deep learning. And if you have enough data and skills and machines and all these uh, challenges that also deep learning poses, uh, it works really well. Okay, it worked so well that uh, in 2012, there was somebody, uh, some, a team from University of Toronto managed to train a neural network with many layers, that's why we call it deep, that actually like by feeding images onto a deep neural network, it managed to train, uh, to solve a problem of not uh, classifying between cats and dogs, but actually classifying between 1000 different object categories on these kind of images. Okay, that model was called AlexNet, and it was trained with a large, a large data set of images, which that contain more than one million images for training and more than 100K images for testing. Um, what well, is important, so this neural network had many parameters. Um, there were a lot of uh, optimization tools and tricks that were used to, to be able to solve that, but since then, deep learning has exploded. It's important, Joe, um, that all this explosion, all this uh, novelty, it wouldn't have been possible without the labeled images. And labeling images means like for each image, write this label that you see here below. There's a mite here, there's a container ship, there's a motor scooter, there's a leopard. That's something that uh, humans should do. And if a human is going to annotate more than 1 million images, okay, you need to pay uh, this human or all these humans uh, quite a lot of money, okay? So that has a cost. Generating labels to solve a problem that can be used to train a neural network, it may have a, a annotation cost, but it worked pretty well. And since then, like, that has been quite a, the approach that taken, but of course, this, this, this approach has a drawback of having to generate the labels in which, with which we are going to train our network. So that's the basic, what, the concepts that I want you to, to know about representation learning. Let's go to another concept, which is unsupervised learning. So I'll go take back my slides uh, from MMLab, and now I'm not focused on the representational learning. So representational learning, it kind of uh, refer to okay, let's 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 not think anymore about what we should extract from the data. Let's let the, our machine learning algorithm or deep neural network algorithm understand or figure out what's important. Now unsupervised learning refers to something else. What does it refer? So maybe some of you have seen this famous cake from Jan Lecun. Remember that that's the chair of on uh, the head on, on Facebook AI. Um, so Jan Lecun has this famous slide on a cake saying like how much um, data we have for learning in different types of uh, setups for learning. Supervised learning is the the setup for learning that would match uh, training a neural network with uh, the millions of the million of labels uh, from ImageNet. Okay, so we have pairs of images and labels. That's called supervised learning. Okay, and supervised learning refers like what happens when we don't have uh, any labels. And there's another type of, of learning that we can think that it's reinforcement learning, which basically the the our neural network or machine learning algorithm is going to take many decisions and just get some just a little bit of, of feedback. So here, what the what it's telling you, kind of the concept of this uh, cake, is that when we, when we are trying to train our AI uh, agents algorithms, we have uh, a lot, of, uh, a very few supervision. Uh, like it's very hard to get labels when you are dealing with reinforcement learning approaches, and that's totally the, out of the scope of today's talk. But just that you know, that when we do supervised learning setup, uh, getting um, labels, uh, guidance for our um, model, uh, we have some that will be like the icing of the cake, okay? So the cherry will be the reinforcement learning. It's, we have so few information, so few guidance to train a reinforcement learning agent. That's very challenging. When you apply a supervised learning paradigm, we have, okay, we can have some, some information to learn from, but most of the substance of the cake, it's the insight. And the insight refers to the unsupervised 
uh, learning. So what it's kind of saying is like, uh, if we could learn without labels in a unsupervised setup, there's so much we can learn from um, uh, in an unsupervised manner. So this is another approach to this, uh, the same cake, but now it's a matrix, okay, in which we have uh, rows, we have whether our agent is active or passive. So an active agent might be a robot that interacts with an environment. And here on this row, it will be like, let's say robots interact with an environment, okay? They can have a teacher rewards or not. For today, let's forget about the robots, but I think it's good that you put the, that you can do the connection with the reinforcement learning algorithms that normally govern robots with what would be a passive agent. It will be, we have a neural network that it doesn't interact with, with the world. I mean, it's like, we, if we have images and labels, the neural network is not changing the labels, not interacting with the images. And when we have a teacher, so when we have our data with our labels, with our teacher, we have supervised learning. If we have no teachers, if we have no label, if we only have the images, then we have unsupervised learning. Let's focus on the supervised learning approach. This is the setup that I'm that I keep describing. We have a training time, we have our training data, uh, our data and the labels. We have our learning algorithm that generates a model. And later at test phase, we just feed new uh, new data, X, and we want our machine learning algorithm to predict whatever. We want the machine learning algorithm to predict if a new image is from a dog or from a cat, okay? So that's, that's the classic setup for, for supervised learning. And it's important that in this setup, we will need to spend money into collecting our labels twice. If we go to unsupervised learning, the difference now is that, hey, there are no labels, okay? There are no why now. We are, we are going to learn without labels. And, be, and now, we, so there will be no annotation cost. And that's very uh, attractive, right? If you can learn something useful without, um, spending money in annotation costs, that's very attractive. There are all, all these companies, that's normally the, the, main, um, the main barrier for companies to deploy deep learning algorithms that they don't have enough labeled data. So, and that here what we're saying like, hey, the unsupervised learning paradigm and techniques can help you with that. There are ways to learn even when you don't have data, which is normally the, the case, right? Because you're anything, uh, sorry, when you don't have labels, because when you generate, la when you generating labels is costly. So, Let's get into the self-supervised learning uh, setup. So now I jump, look, there was unsupervised learning means like we learn without labels. And now inside unsupervised learning, there is self-supervised learning. So from this figure, you can already see that self-supervised learning is a, let's say a subset of, the, of a broader field called unsupervised learning. And again, and some part of this self-supervised learning, it really aims at learning representations. This, this part I will I will explain a bit more exactly what what the shaded area means. So let's let's see what self-supervised learning means. So I will keep following the story with uh, Yalekun. Actually, she had this cherry uh, cake that I sorry the black forest cake that I mentioned with the cherry on top. And actually, uh, a year ago, 2019, he kind of modified a little bit uh, the the story or the terminology, not the story, the terminology, because this is, again, this is something that has exploded very lately. He said, hey, now I will call it self-supervised learning to the unsupervised. So it's kind of saying, instead of saying, calling it unsupervised learning, I will call it self-supervised learning because unsupervised is both a loaded and confusing term. And it's true. There are like so many techniques that probably you, ha you have heard about, like all these clustering techniques like k-means or ransack or whatever, which actually don't have anything to do with self-supervised learning, which have been classically been um, assigned to unsupervised learning techniques. And it's true that self-supervised learning, it's kind of a subset of that. There are no labels, as in clustering algorithms, but the approach is kind of uh, a little bit different. Now you will see, you understand why. So he said, in self-supervised learning, the system learns to predict part of its input from other parts of the input. I will deploy this now in the next slide, but actually this is a post on Facebook. You can click there if you want to read it all. I, again, I insist that there are like links everywhere. Okay, but if you read the whole post, at some point he says, doing this properly and reliably is the greatest challenge in machine learning and artificial intelligence on the next few years, in my opinion. So, okay, so he thinks that that's important and he's a quite a respected voice in, in this field. Let's see what he means now for this part of a system learns to predict a part of its input from other parts. I will develop more on this. So 
just rephrasing it, we could say that self-supervised learning is a form of unsupervised learning where the data provides the supervision. So how does it work? So normally we have data, which is not labeled X. And what we're going to do, we are going to invent uh, what we call a pretext or surrogate task. So actually what we say is a pretext or surrogate task must be invented by withholding a part of the a label data and training a neural network to predict it. So in, in this case, we are, I'm already uh, focusing on neural networks, yeah? Um, so, of course, this idea of withholding a part of the label data, it's very abstract. Now I'll give you all these examples, but I think they, that this definition fits quite well in many of the, of the tasks and examples I will give you from, from now in, in, the, in the next part of, of the presentation. I will just highlight here that it is especially important, uh, this setup, because deep neural networks, they are very powerful. They are very good at learning representations at, at, as function approximators, but they need quite a lot of data, okay? And that's why there has been this huge amount of interest in self-supervised learning uh, now because of deep neural networks. While maybe in the past, uh, when we didn't need so, for, so many labels, data that was not there was not so much interest maybe when we're using uh, random forest or super vector machines you don't need that's not such a big deal but for deep neural networks it is a big deal we need lots of data to train uh, these 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 models so what are we going to do now so imagine that we have our label data we withhold a part of it that's this part that we withhold so some part of the data I'm not showing it to the network and I feed that into a neural network and then what I'm going to do is I will ask my neural network to predict this part of the data that it has not seen, okay? If you know about neural networks, you will know that in order to train, to estimate the parameters that govern these uh, models, what you need to do is to define a loss function, which is a, a way of measuring how well your network, your prediction for networks match the data that it's not being shown to the, to the network. And when you do that, you can estimate uh, all, all these parameters. And what is very interesting is that you will learn what's called representations, which means like the input, representation of the input data. So the input data will be represented in different ways across uh, a hierarchy of layers. So this, you feed the, your new image of a cat here, okay, in a neural network. And it, after the first layer, you have a transformation of that image on a deck of a cat into a, a feature, a new feature representation, a representation of the input image. After the second layer, you have another representation, okay, which is equivalent because it comes from the same source, but it's um, it's not actually, it's not totally equivalent. It means like it's it's uh, refined to solve the final task, which in this case, the final task will, will be predicting uh, the, the part of data that we are missing. And I will give you examples. Maybe it's a bit too abstract now, but you see now I'll give you like, Many examples about uh, how can you invent uh, this kind of task in which some part of the data that you have, you don't show it to the network. So if you know what the neural networks, we can predict the loss, so we can estimate the parameters. And this is what connects us with representation learning, okay? If in a self-supervised task, we can learn representations here, this, this is a way of uh, learn, learning representations. There are other ways. ImageNet, it's a way of representation uh, learning representations, but that was with labels provided from ImageNet, okay? When we train uh, our neural network to solve the ImageNet task, but you can, we can also define uh, self-supervised tasks that will also uh, provide ways to learn representations and that will, is going to be useful for do uh, something else. So what, what can we do with, with these uh, features? So there's a concept that I want to introduce uh, in case you don't know it, which is transfer learning and it's uh, it's crucial in, in, to understand why self-supervised learning is important. Because at this point, you may think, okay, good. Uh, so I learned these representations. So by somehow I'm solving a task of predicting a part of data that I already had and then run representations, but okay. But what's the use of, of, of predicting uh, a part of the data that I already had? That looks quite useless a little bit, right? But here, the trick is here. The trick is that there's a, another family of techniques or concept, which is called transfer learning, which basically says that, imagine that you have, you really want to solve a, a task, uh, um, image classification task, image, but imagine that now you have a data set with, that is not as large as ImageNet, it's much smaller. For example, that's the case of the Pascal data set. As it's smaller, uh, there's not enough data 
to estimate all the parameters of a deep neural network. So if you try to solve the Pascal data set, the image classification task on this smaller data set on, a, on the same neural network that you use to train uh, on ImageNet, it will probably not work because you don't have enough data to estimate all the parameters. And that, that's, a, that's a problem, right? So what's the trick later normally that, that you do that has been done traditionally? It's like, hey, let's do something. Let's take my network that is trained on ImageNet, for which I have a large amount of data and labels. And as this source data, this ImageNet data, it's kind of similar to the images that you, you find in this other data set, this Pascal data set. And it, it's true, I mean, you can search for it, but they are like images of objects in general. Um, what I will do is I will reuse what I learned from the ImageNet uh, uh, data from uh, and the ImageNet classes, which are not exactly the same as Pascal. I think Pascal has 20 classes, 20 object categories, while ImageNet had 1,000. But I will reuse it. So I will first train my model with ImageNet. And then I will do something called fine tuning, which is, which is kind of means like adapting uh, my model. But that, let's say you can think that it was initialized with ImageNet for the new task, which is Pascal. If we apply exactly the setup that I show you here, it has a problem because now I'm here, I'm, I'm learning with ImageNet and the ImageNet labels, right? So, okay, that helps the, the that helps the problem of uh, I can, I can um, have an image classifier, which is good for my smaller data set, but I still need these labels, which was at the beginning, I was motivating that the solution of supervised learning or the motivation is like, we don't need as many labels. So what can uh, we do? Okay, I think I will skip these details. So what can we do is instead of pre-training my model with ImageNet, I'm going to retrain my model with a self-supervised task for which I don't need labels because what I'm doing is I'm inventing a task that gets for free at, at no cost. And then later, uh, when I finish this pre-training, now I fine tune with my Pascal images or with whatever data set images, okay? So traditionally people, at least in the computer vision or maybe you, you have used it in other domains, they, you, you, they have uh, used transfer learning in a setup in which you train with a large data set which is labeled, so it has a cost. And then this powerful model, I fine tune it, I adapt it to, to my small data set for which I have uh, few data and few labels. Not now the, the idea, the change of paradigm of self-supervised is like, hey, you don't if you can figure out a self-supervised task which is good enough, which is valuable enough to learn good representations for your final task without labels, this pre-training will come for free. You will not need your labels on ImageNet or on a larger data set, and you can still do the fine tuning on your smaller data set. And that's basically the story of self-supervised learning. If you want to know more about transfer learning, you can check these video lectures, but that's out of the scope of the of the chalk. Now, if we focus on self-supervised learning, uh, you will see that there are like kind of two big families of approaches to to gener to define self-supervised learning task. Okay, one of them it's the generative predictive family, and the other one is a contrastive family. I will just uh, give you examples for both of them, and so you have a, 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 an overview of everything. So the basic idea here is that um, the loss, remember that when I said that uh, in order to, to estimate the parameters of our neural network, we need to compute a loss, a metric that tells how good we are doing. So we can, you can compute the loss on the output space. I mean, imagine that you have uh, the ImageNet problem, for example, um, you have your data, your images, and you, at the output, you have your, um, <coughs> your labels, right? So you, you, could, you could be uh, generating some, some sort of, of labels that you can understand and, and give uh, a notion intuition for, what, for, for them or not. Or you just, you're, you're just going to basically train. Um, you are going to feed to, the, to your network two data points or three, okay? And sometimes say, okay, these are the points, they are similar or not, okay? And, and actually what you're going, so as you know that these data points are similar or not, they, they belong to the same, class, let's say, or not, for, for you, for your task, then you can uh, force that their representations 
they should be similar or not. And then that's when you learn contrastive tasks. Okay, these are the two big families. Now we'll just give you uh, examples for both of them. Uh, so you get a, have some, some place to start from. So let's start with the generative and predictive, which are maybe the easiest ones to, to understand because you, you can really see like what's, what's, what's going on. So for example, one basic and most clear uh, example for uh, predictive methods are the autoencoders in which you fit data in your neural network and you want the output to have the same data. You can compute a loss and that's something that, that you can do. Okay, I will just go a bit faster. Uh, you can uh, also, that's kind of the example of, uh, there's a, a variation which, which, which maybe you fit data into your, your model, but you mask uh, some form of data. So you, you, you show the model, you have, let's say a text and you take some of part of the text out and then you fit the, the remaining text into your model and you want the network to predict what was missing. That's called a mask autoencoder. And if you are familiar with natural language processing, that's one of the tasks that this very famous BERT model uh, has been trained for, okay? So by doing this, this task, which is self-supervised, because let's see, if you have like the whole Wikipedia downloaded, you can take sen sentences, remove a part of the sentence, and then ask the model, train the model to predict the part that it's missing. Yeah, that's a, a, a quite a clear example of a self-supervised task, because it's a task that you don't need human annotators there. You can just remove this percentage of the words uh, randomly. You can, for example, uh, have tasks for spatial relations. Maybe you have like in an image, you take crops of, of a bounding box and, and then they're like some other, so you take two crops, sorry, two crops from the, from the image, like this one and this two. And then you ask the model to, to tell you what is the spatial relation they have. If they are located in the, with this spatial relation, so this crop is on the top right of this other crop, that's what you ask the model to learn from. And then you learn this way that the model learns to reason. And again, without labels. You can uh, ask a models to, to solve a jigsaw that uh, has also been explored as well for images. That's this is a model that learns the, the jigsaw. Uh, you can ask if you have videos, you can ask, uh, show the model how, like a sequence of video frames and ask if they were in order or not. And you can learn interesting features as well with that. You can ask, uh, provide the model like sequences of, of frames which are not in order, which are shuffled and ask them to be ordered, like similar to the jigsaw case, or, or even more funny, uh, you can just feed video that move goes forward or, 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 or rewind it, like if it goes backwards in time and you ask the model if that video was, was played forward or backward. And you can also learn interesting features with, with that. Okay, consistency means like um, if you, don't know, if you have a video sequence of video and you say, okay, so this pixel is, should be similar to what and to, to similar to this, then you, le you learn a model that actually when you go backwards and you say, okay, this, this bounding box, so not, so this bounding box is similar to this and so is similar to this. Actually, as you, as you should finish at the same place where you started, you can compute a loss here. And that's a, these are like a uh, single consistency task, right? Okay. Another uh, famous task is actually like predicting the next frame in video. And that's actually one of the, of the task that Yale Kuhn uh, solved. So if you have a video, you can ask the neural network to give a sequence of videos, just give me the next video frame, try to generate that. And that's something you can, you can try and you can learn in a similar way how in language models, uh, if you are dealing with language, like these models, what they do is they learn to predict the next word on the, on the sequence. Maybe you have the cat sits on the, and then you ask the model to predict what's the next word. That's a, another way to, and you can uh, train models. Okay, that's with videos. Another one is if you have color images, you can fit the grayscale image into the model and ask it to predict the chroma, the colors that comes for free as well. And you can learn very useful features. Actually, by, by, by doing that, it was also a solve, uh, I just saw the example, like uh, solving uh, only with the image of the left, you could colorize the a a video sequence on in black and white. So here, I think they have here the idea. So you have a reference frame, you have a grayscale video, and with this idea, you can uh, get the colorized video that you see on the right. Okay, so the, the video you see on the right is a colorized video from the grayscale video you see on the, on the middle. And again, in order to do that, to colorize um, old movies, for example, you don't need much. You don't need a human. They're telling you like which should be the color because we all have color videos and we can just turn them into uh, grayscale and then learn from them. Okay, just to finish, 
a brief idea of what's the state of the art nowadays, which are these contrastive methods. Uh, this 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 second uh, family of algorithms that let's say now it's not that obvious as the examples that I just show. They are it's more like uh, now we are going to be dealing with pairs of data samples and say okay these these two pairs belong are should be put close together and some others should be uh, put close to apart. Maybe some of you have heard about triplet loss. That's kind of a similar concept, maybe with some uh, small variation in terms of mathematical impl implication, but that's kind of kind of similar. So just to explain uh, contrastive um, contrastive methods, I will explain a very short story. So um, this sir here, this professor here is Alexei Efros from UC Berkeley. And he has been, uh, he was one of the authors of that first word that I mentioned earlier on colorizing uh, images. So that you can train a neural network to predict the chroma out of a grayscale image, right? So, and then he has this, uh, so he has been working on self-supervised learning and he's been one of the person who has coined this term for the community and actually in 2015 uh, he had a, a bet called a gelato bet with another professor from berkeley a jitin dramatic that you see here in the picture and the bet the gelato bet was kind of the following it says like um if by the first day of autumn september 23 of 2015 a method will exist that can match or beat the performance of rcnn rcnn is an object detector but never mind. On Pascal, on Pascal, bulk detection. So it means like in this data set that I mentioned earlier that it's kind of it's not as large as ImageNet. Okay. So there's a model that solves some task on this smaller data set, but said, but without the use of any extra human annotation, example, Im ImageNet as pre-training, Mr. Malik promises to buy Mr. Efros one gelato, two scoops, one chocolate, one vanilla. So there was a, a bet that, that they had. So what was uh, Mr. Efros, Professor Efros was kind of saying, say, he's saying like, I think that by uh, in 2015, so that was that was probably in, I think it was 2014, so the day be before when when there was this model RCNN that was doing pretty good at detecting objects, but this model uh, it was it was exploiting a pre-training on ImageNet. So it, it's a one of these cases of transfer learning. It's a model that it took uh, a network that was pre-trained on labels on ImageNet. And then they did something else to solve a problem of object detection, which is like throwing a bounding box around the objects. And the bet was saying, "Hey, I think that next in one year time, we, I will be able to, will be able to have this uh, one of these RCNN models work as well as the one we have with pre on ImageNet, but without using any ImageNet labels." Okay, that was the bet. So. <coughs> This contrast, so sorry, I was introducing the contrasting love. So the contrastive love loss, basically what it's telling you, this is, the, this is the formulation, but basically the concept is like, if we have similar pair of data points, X1 and X1 and X2, we'll, we'll have a loss that we'll, uh, that we'll try to reduce. So when we have a loss in your network, we always want to make it small, okay? So we will train your network so that when we have a similar pair, this will be small, because this D is a, a Euclidean distance, okay, and G is the, will be the neural network that we are uh, estimating. So we train with a loss that says similar pairs will be will have uh, will be in a small distance in the feature space. And when we have like dissimilar pairs, if with x1 and x2 are dissimilar, then we will we we'll make them. Uh, so there's there's a minus here, okay. Uh, we, it's kind of saying like we want it to make large, okay? So we want that for these cases, uh, the, the distance is large. So again, it's the same concept of the triplet loss. So that's this how this contrastive loss works. So basically, and maybe I will just keep the details, but you can go, I refer you down to the, to the paper. Uh, there was this model called MOCO that was kind of um, given uh, images. It was a uh, learning uh, features that when compared with a, uh, Let's say with a buffer of of uh, of other images or crops, you will see now the task. It, it was using the contrastive loss to compute the similarity. Okay, that's and then they, they did something else called the momentum encoder. But in, in the end, the concept is that they were doing pairs not of images, but actually they were they were uh, comparing pairs of crops of images. So given they had a, a large uh, data set, let's say ImageNet, but without labels, and then they started getting crops out of, of ImageNet, and when there were two crops from the same image, say, uh, this would be like the X1 and X2, if they were from the same images, 
you said I want them to be to have similar features, but if they are from different images, if X1 from X2 are two crops from two different um, images on ImageNet, I want them to be apart. Okay, and to do that, you don't need any labels at all. So they did they pre-train a neural network with 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 ImageNet with labels. That would be the the classic transfer learning supervised. That's why right here supervised, and they did it with the contrasted love with Moco with ImageNet, but without labels. Okay, and that's the important thing. So they had Moco ImageNet one million one million images of ImageNet with this Moco model contrastive loss or supervised ImageNet, which is the classic one, the one that I started from with, uh, they had these two models. And then they transfer the model that they train to Pascal, as I explained later, uh, earlier, sorry. And then they uh, show that, yes, that in this case, they could take this model, uh, RCNN, actually it's a, a variation, which is more modern, but they managed to uh, improve the performance to have a better performance with the models pre-trained on Moco with one million images from ImageNet, it was working better than the model that was pre-trained in a supervised manner with uh, ImageNet one million. And also here you compare, like if you, instead of doing a pre-training, you start with uh, random weights. So this, this, the first line would be like, what if you don't have anything, if you don't do a transfer learning, just start from here with a model initialized randomly. Okay, so that's, 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 that's the when the gelato bet, like when it was solved, that when the, the bet happened. But that was sorry, I should go back. That was uh, presented in last APR. So it, this was presented in a conference this year in 2020. So it was actually was published online in in 2019. So remember that the bet was about 2015, but actually that that milestone was achieved in 2019. So uh, Professor Efros lost the gelato, he never got the gelato, although his contributions are super valuable nowadays for this community on self-supervised learning. So this, there has been, there are like so many more uh, evolutions. Now it's a hot topic on research. So there's, I could probably stay here. Uh, uh, so people have tried to do uh, data augmentation. And now here there's even, if you wanna check this kind of a leaderboard dish uh, on papers with code, where you can see like all the papers that are trying to, to beat this with, different ideas, okay? So you see here, the first one is using colorization. And then the last one I took it today, I think it's the same clear model with FreshNet, whatever. So there's, there's a lot of variations on that. And I asked uh, my master student who's working on this to do a list. So he very kindly, Oscar Mañas, put all this list of papers that, that probably you wanna check it out if you are very interested in, in the field. And, and so I thank Oscar for making this, this effort if you want to learn more, but I think it's out of the scope of this talk to, to go to that level of detail, okay? So that will be the end of, of my talk. If you allow me one more minute, uh, just to tell you a bit more about the deep learning community in Barcelona. Oh, sorry, first, first some more details. If you want to more, learn more, there's this talk, uh, this blog post from Alex Rafe from, and Kelly Clancy from DeepMind. There are these talks from uh, all these legends on artificial intelligence, on the self-supervised learning approach. Uh, this lecture from Peter, uh, sorry, Erwin Sirivindas from Berkeley from this year, also on the topic. And also we have our own talks on unsupervised learning, if you want to check them out online. And also this kind of a similar talk to what I had today uh, from last year. If you want, in, if you are interested in, in knowing more, I'll be uh, giving a tutorial in a conference in Dublin in uh, October 26. So if we can travel there, that would be really fun. And if not, maybe I guess there will be some something online, uh, so you can you can watch. And in that that case, I will introduce language, vision, audio, and speech, which is super fun. But again, I don't have time to to, to cover this. You can you can check it out if you want these slides, which are like the which will be related to this tutorial. Also, as I mentioned, I want to tell you a bit about our community in Barcelona. So we, uh, mainly uh, researchers in academia and industry, we are organizing every year this Deep Learning Barcelona Catalonia, this kind of a showcasing uh, research done by researchers which are in Barcelona or who maybe studied or have spent some time in Barcelona, now they are in other labs. So we had like uh, very uh, influencing people around the world 
and in Barcelona as well on this community, and we're very happy with it. So I suggest that you check it out. Uh, so we are going to organize something in 2020. Uh, I'm not sure, of course, online or on site, but uh, you are invited to check it out. Also, we have all our, if you're interested in deep learning, we have all our lectures online. We have videos and slides. We have deep learning for AI, for computer vision, for language, for speech. Now we just started the reinforcement learning uh, series as well, and we put everything online. So hopefully that's going to be valuable, especially for those of you who, for you, it, which is difficult to access these kind of contents on for wherever you, you are. Okay. Uh, related to this, we also run a program on postgraduate course, which is like a four months program on artificial intelligence with deep learning. Uh, so we have two two formats: a face-to-face -face classic. Uh, format and we we were going to start an, uh, an online edition as well in November 2020 so you can check them out if you want and if you are interested in if you are if your profile is more like research maybe you are a PhD student who want to do a visit us or a master student who's thinking about doing a PhD you can check our slides it might be of interest to you and I think that's that's all uh, thank you very much for your time I'm very glad that you made it and also thank my, my team, which actually makes everything possible here. Thank you.